And I think we, we live in such a highly dynamic environment where change no longer comes in generational terms. I mean, when, when probably um, when I grew up, um, a generation was supposed to last 30 years. I mean, today you can say every five years um, you have a pretty different environment. The message from North Korea was stark. But their missile program and technology keeps moving forward. When you add to it the other geopolitical tensions out there, uh, what's going on in North Korea, what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea, it's really trending uh, pretty significantly in the wrong direction. Things cross borders with uh, in, in tremendous speed, in tremendous uh, volume, and we simply, and the question is, how is the world going to uh, contend with it? How is the world going to deal with various threats to either uh, peace between countries or stability uh, within them? Especially in the last 40 years, urbanization has been on such an unprecedented scale that scholars are now talking about planetary urbanism or ecological urbanism. Of course, there's the Agenda 2030, which is a whole other program of, uh, which promotes open borders and redistribution of wealth. It's a whole program that they're trying to initiate, working not with states or governments, not working with states, working with cities. This means that the very nature, if you like, of the rural is also being urbanized in very complex and multifaceted ways. This is part of the agenda that the UN understands that if we're going to take control of the world, we're not going to be able to take control of nations, we're not going to be able to take control of states, we have to take control of cities. So the pace of urbanization is picking up enormously in Africa at absolutely unprecedented rates, but also in other regions. And just last week they completed uh, a, a major meeting of almost all the major cities around the world gathering together, part of putting together this agenda to bring together what they call Habitat 3, an urban agenda. As the world continues to urbanise, sustainable development challenges will increasingly concentrate in cities. And establishing a, a, a regime that will control resources will basically, the idea of, of zoning and controlling, getting people to concentrate into high-rise apartments instead of taking up the beautiful forest lands. The big problem with global governance t today is really in the sort of normative or, or the, the, the purposeful uh, desire to create a particular type of world order. Could you just sort of explain for what the liberal order is? It, the liberal order is basically a set of uh, principles and rules and norms and standards that basically are, are based on the principle of openness. <laughs> The, the agreement to live under a certain set of rules uh, of, that uh, everyone abides by. But when you were in the White House with uh, George H.W. Bush in the first Gulf War, uh, he talked about a new world order, a phrase that sounds infelicitous now. George Herbert Bush, you know, the first George Bush president, made this statement, he says, we have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations, a new world order. This is the first time embryo-like structures have been developed in laboratories using two types of stem cells. Now this next level of genetic science is giving rise to so-called designer babies. scaffold, they were able to grow a structure capable of assembling itself into an artificial embryo. See, it's no longer science fiction. It's serious business. It's the tools, the powers are coming into our hands. Artificial embryos may sound like a plot in a sci-fi novel. And last but not least, that in this new era, you know, the UN needs to absolutely change its game, its way of operating. Uh, not as if one, but definitely as one. And I think this is, this is a crucial part. And as Izumi was saying, this is certainly going to be a, a very important test. 
and, and challenge for the new Secretary General coming in because all of these agendas now call for the UN to work differently. There's no question that in certain areas um, efforts in international cooperation have borne fruit. Uh, we have had over in recent years uh, successes with respect to uh, the Paris climate deal, for instance. We have had uh, successes with respect to the sustainable development agenda at the United Nations. It's interesting because in, in the Paris Agreement, <clears throat> Jill and I spent hours arguing over one word. And the word was, shall we say, shall or should. Because in legal parlance, they mean very different things. If it says these nations, these 193 nations should, well, then it's voluntary. If they say they shall, then it's a legal agreement. Well, John Kerry and Barack Obama knew that they couldn't, if they put shall there, they'd have to bring it to Congress. Congress would have to ratify it because shall means it's a treaty and Congress has to approve all treaties. So what they did is they changed it and they put should on the opening statement. But every other single item in that agreement uses the word shall. So it's a hidden language of treaty. Iran has gone ahead and successfully test-fired a sophisticated Russian-made air defense system. Iran and Russia have recently increased their military cooperation. They are two of the most important players on the global stage. So there's certainly more overlap between Turkey and Russia than there was a few years ago. What does this mean for the future of the Middle East and especially Israel? The headline around violence is that on current trends it will be a more violent world in 2030. Now the number of cases of human bird flu infection is rising rapidly in China. And they're reporting a sudden increase in the number of human cases that exceeds previous flu seasons. Really, the rate of emergence of these viruses is more rapid than the rate of urbanization or changes in poultry farming practices. So there's something else there's something going else. on. So 70 years ago, Aldous Huxley, anticipating the transformation of human life through advances in biology as the final and most searching revolution, asserted this really revolutionary revolution is to be achieved not in the external world, but in the souls and flesh of human beings. This holds great promise for advances in agriculture and animal studies basic biomedical research and therapy, but opens fundamental questions about our role within the natural order and the use of these technologies in shaping the human future. The opportunities of these new gene editing technologies are perhaps the most profound and difficult matters our, our species has ever encountered. Together with advances in cytology, systems biology, bioengineering, and the great advances in computer sciences that are making all this kind of stuff possible, these together open unprecedented powers for exploring and constructively deploying the fundamental forces of living nature in the service of human life, in the service of the good of the planet. An article just last week, organisms created with synthetic DNA pathways for entirely new forms of life. This is where we're heading. This is amazing stuff. More recently, some have raised the disturbing but strangely logical suggestion that since embryos left over from IVF are being used to obtain embryonic stem cells, 
Why not use them for projects that include their genetic alteration, implantation, and later extraction of their cells, tissues, and organs? This is just an extension of the argument that, that says they were going to die anyway, so why not gain something good from their life? Well, it's a strange moment in human civilization. There is wide recognition that our new gene editing tools are a threshold technology, an opportunity for us to re-envision and reorder our place and purpose within the natural world. The issues involved go beyond biology. It's exciting stuff when you begin to realize that we are reading tomorrow's headlines today. And it assures us in our hearts that, God, you are controlling the flow of history. It's not just something that is coming because of happenstance or circumstance. God, you are directing the world towards a, a point of destiny. 